If you are following the printed order of service that goes with today's sermon, you will notice that there are no Bible readings included. That is quite deliberate because today it is Trinity Sunday, the only day in the calendar that focuses mainly on a doctrine of the church. There is no part of the Bible that refers to God the Holy Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity comes solely from the mind of human beings, and it didn't really get a formal airing until the late 4th century. When we look at the Bible, though, we can see evidence of the early church's experience of the Trinity. St Paul writes in his letter to the Romans, We have peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, and God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And in the Gospel of John, Jesus says to the disciples, All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that the Spirit of truth will take what is mine and declare it to you. So, The ideas of God as Father, as Son and as Holy Spirit were already present. But for the first few hundred years, no one had grappled with how they fitted together in a way that made much sense. Jesus and the earliest disciples were faithful Jews and their understanding of God was clearly monotheistic. There is one God to be worshipped. But very soon the first followers of the way were talking of worshipping Jesus, the risen Messiah, and of being guided and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And it's not until someone challenged that and said, you seem to be talking about three different gods, that they began having to try to put it all into words that made any sense. On the other hand, many of the early Christians, especially in some of the churches Paul was planting around Europe, they were not traditional Jews, they were Gentiles, and they came from a pagan background in the Greek and Roman world. And as you know, the ancient Greeks and the Romans, they were not monotheists at all. They were polytheists. They had whole pantheons of gods, a god of this, a god of that, and a god of the other thing. So, for many of them, offering worship to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would have initially just seemed like switching to a smaller pantheon. Anyway, all of this comes to a head with a character called Arius. For 400 years, it had been pretty much assumed among the followers of Jesus that Jesus was divine, that Jesus was in fact God in human form. But Arius sincerely and convincingly questioned this. Arius, who loved the Jesus of the Gospels, argued that Jesus should be understood as an exemplary human being only, because Almighty God is so far above us humans and is utterly independent of and complete in himself, the idea of Almighty God taking on a human expression of himself is outrageous. For Arius, the idea of God lowering himself to become personally involved with his creatures was demeaning and blasphemous. Arius argued powerfully that the idea was nothing more than a pagan vulgarization of God. It made Almighty God like one of the gods of the Greek pantheon, a sort of 
superhero who ate and drank and fought and occasionally dropped in for a sexual liaison which might result in fathering a human child. Arius insisted that this was a disgusting insult to Almighty God. But Arius was opposed by another theologian, Athanasius, the Bishop of Alexandria. Athanasius argued that the essential defining feature of God was not utter independence, but self-giving love, a love that gives and gives and gives. And Athanasius argued that this self-giving occurs even within the Godhead, that between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, there is total mutual self-giving. And then this self-giving overspills. It looks outwards and expresses itself in a total humble nearness to others, including you and me. God gets totally involved, said Athanasius, with us. Loving, cherishing, nurturing, craving our response and giving in return. God is the Spirit who moves through us with every breath, who whispers into our ear, who prompts us and cajoles us towards God-likeness, expressed in self-giving and love. Athanasius accused Arius of having a sterile God, one who sits in isolated splendour, useless, irrelevant and passionless. The God made known in Jesus of Nazareth is dynamic, involved, always busy, relating, cherishing, shining, revealing, expressing, giving. A God who can know joy and pain. A God who longs for us to return the love we are shown. A God who hurts when we fail to respond and who grieves when we damage ourselves in the process. The very earliest Christians experienced God in certain ways, and as they attempted to describe their experience, the idea of the Trinity began to emerge. They began with their experience of the living God, all the theology came afterwards. At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter whether you agree with the doctrine of the Trinity or not, or even whether you understand it or ever will. What does matter is whether you have a personal relationship with God and that you are journeying more and more deeply into that relationship with God. The doctrine is important, of course, but only as an attempt to make sense of the experience. And like falling in love, making sense of it is meaningless unless the experience is real to you. The doctrine of the Trinity is an assertion that, despite appearances to the contrary, there is only one God. <laughs>